This video made possible by Killer Visual Strategies. Visit KillerVisualStrategies.com. So 21st century medicine uh, really has arisen from two things. One is the emergence of the uh, sequence of the genome and the deductions that could be made. The second is the application of systems thinking, that is, uh, taking a holistic, integrated view toward uh, the complexity both of wellness and disease. These two together have led to a 21st century medicine that has several major uh, components. One, if you think deeply about what you'd like medicine to be, it should be predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. We've called that P4 medicine. And that immediately leads you to conceptualize that healthcare really has two major domains, the domain of wellness, the domain of uh, disease, and wellness uh, has, at least until recently, uh, largely uh, been ignored. That's why in 2014, Nathan Price and I decided we would attack this problem of wellness in a quantitative fashion by doing what we call deep phenotyping. That is, we persuaded 108 of our friends to participate in a nine-month experiment where we literally took billions of measurements on them. We did the genome sequence. We did blood draws every three months to analyze 1,200 analytes, proteins, clinical chemistries, metabolites. We did the gut microbiome every three months, and we used Fitbit and other devices for quantized self-measurements. Collectively, they created, created for each individual a data cloud that, when analyzed, led to a unique list of actionable possibilities for each of the individuals, depending on the contribution of their genetics, their lifestyle, uh, and their environments. The actionable possibilities came from the literature, bona fide possibilities, and if acted upon, either improve wellness and or let one avoid or at least uh, ameliorate disease. We actually created coaches that brought these actionable possibilities to the individuals Coaches were trained in psychology, and they had an incredible record of achieving uh, more than 70% of the actionable possibilities. I will tell you, uh, I was one of the 108 individuals, and it was really a remarkable change for me who thought I really knew a lot about health. I lost more than 20 pounds, and I now weigh just about what I weighed when I played uh, football in college. And that was done in a painless way, guided in part by genetics that tell you how to diet most efficiently. I, I took on more extensive exercises, again, based on how you can optimize energy output and things like this. So I routinely now do 100 push-ups in the morning and 100 sit-ups and uh, spend more than an hour uh, on exercise, and I figure I'm, I'm back where I was, at least in my mid-30s or 40s or so. Uh, I had five nutritional deficiencies, which got corrected in various ways. Uh, an inflammatory index that we reduced by uh, proper uh, diet. Vitamin D deficiency that was really strikingly low that was not at all helped by a classic 1,000 international units of vitamin D a day because it turned out that I had two of about six variants that could block the uptake of vitamin D, and you needed megadoses to get back to normal uh, and to maintain yourself. I actually have recently created the P4 Medicine Institute that has taken this scientific wellness, as we have it here, uh, to a new dimension with glucose monitoring Fitbits, if you have any diabetes in your family, you ought to find out how you react to food. And with continuous glucose monitoring, you can do uh, spectacular NF1 experiments, and so forth. I would say the 
outcome the end of this initial pilot project in wellness was an enormous success. One, individuals did get weller. Two, uh, the data, as we'll see in a few moments, has been fantastic. There was so much enthusiasm on the base of 108 individuals that we started a company called Aerovail in mid-2015 to bring scientific wellness to consumers. And over the next four years, they accumulated more than 6,000 clients for which each of which had these longitudinal data clouds. And the data clouds are really incredible. And I, I compare them in many ways to the Hubble telescope because what they've let us do is look at human biology and disease with a resolution we never had before. And I'll give you examples of this. Number one, with the data from the six different types of data fields that we uh, analyzed. We could ask whether a data bit in one data type correlated statistically with data bits in any of the other five types, implying that the corresponding systems they represented were interrelated. We found in looking at about 500 proteins, 3,500 such correlations. In looking at 5,000 proteins, we found 35,000 such correlations, and they brought into focus interrelationships we never had imagined before, and they give us a completely new statistical approach to thinking about how to do biomarkers and how to identify drug targets. Number two, we found that polygenic scores that could be derived from looking at genome-wide association data, data and mapping it for each individual into uh, a genetic risk score for more than 100 different diseases was absolutely incredible. So we could line all of the individuals up with regard to low to high risk. And the observations were striking. Number one, if you're at high risk for a given disease, you often are going to need to be treated completely differently than if you're at low risk. And an example of this is the risk for LDL cholesterol, which is uh, a proxy for cardiovascular disease. If you're at high risk for LDL and you have a high cholesterol, diet, exercise, don't touch that. You need statins and uh, other types of drugs. Conversely, if you're at the low end, diet and exercise, bring it down nicely. So we're going to find that these polygenic scores are going to fundamentally change how we treat patients. Moreover, if you're at high risk, we can use these data clouds to follow the earliest transitions, wellness to disease, and begin to reverse them uh, immediately. A second thing that we were able to show, again with the polygenic scores, is we map them against the 1,200 blood analytes that we'd analyzed. And we found more than 800 of these analytes varied directly or inversely to the polygenic scores. And in many cases, the analytes reflected known mechanisms of disease. And in many cases, where we don't know anything about mechanisms, they suggest mechanisms for disease. So again, it's going to be a powerful new uh, statistical approach to fundamentally understanding disease. Number three, one of the things I like best is that with 6,000 people, we were able to classify them into age groups, uh, 10 years, uh, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, up to 80 to 90. And to show, as time passed, your ability to control the expression of blood analytes diminished in a linear progressive manner. And we could actually use that observation to calculate for each individual their biological age, that is, the age that your body says you are, as opposed to your chronologic age. And obviously, ideally, you want your biologic age to be as far below your chronologic age as possible. 
We looked at 300 people in Aravel that had type 2 diabetes on average. Their biological age was six years greater than their chronologic age. We looked at, uh, we looked at 250 people with cardiovascular complications. Their average age was three years older. And we looked at people that fell in the upper 5% of Fitbit activity, and their average ages turned out to be three years younger than their uh, chronologic age. My own uh, observation was that I'm now 15 years younger than my biological age, and it's actually going down. So my colleague, Jim Heath, who's just taken uh, over heading up uh, ISB, likes to say, he and I are racing towards 65, but we're coming from different directions. <laughs> the interesting point is, we're really thinking about the possibility of starting a company. And let me say, the 1,200 analytes that we average and analyze in this context sample hundreds of biological systems. So it's, it's a measurement that's spread throughout the biology of you as an organism. Wouldn't it be interesting to be able to determine your biological age once a year and assess whether it's gone down, good, gone up, bad, but it would be a metric for assessing healthy aging. And the fourth observation that I think is really going to be important is we saw in the 6,000 Aravel individuals 100, more than 100 people that transitioned from wellness to disease for all the major chronic diseases. We were able to take individuals that had carried out this transition, and because we had longitudinal blood draws prior to the diagnosis, we could go out as far as four years and ask, is there evidence for transitions in blood analytes that occur uh, three or four or five years before the actual diagnosis came? And in all cases, the answer was yes. And in most cases, the answer turned out to be that the analytes that were uh, uh, off scale away from the average for the 6,000 individuals generally gave insights into the disease and even suggested the possibility of biomarkers uh, and or possible drug targets. So the vision for the future then is, if you are carrying out this scientific wellness with these data clouds gathered uh, every six months or so, we'll be able to see any time you transition from wellness to disease, we'll be able to get biomarkers for that earliest transition point, and we can take systems approaches to generating therapies that will reverse the disease before it ever manifests itself as a disease phenotype. And this is the uh, prevention of the uh, 21st century. But it, it brings us to a fascinating new model of how to think about health and disease. It is, in fact, a continuum where you are well up to a point, you make the transition, and then go into disease. And what's interesting about 20th and 21st century medicine, 20th century medicine studies disease after it's manifest itself. And I would say in many cases, too late for reversibility and maybe too late for even dealing with it effectively. 21st century studies wellness and that earliest transition and the reversal at that point. That is one of the fundamental differences between the two. I'll tell you, we've recently taken on the challenge of Alzheimer's as a chronic disease with this model in mind. And what we knew from the literature is that metabolic PET scanning can actually detect the initial changes in Alzheimer's between four and 10 years earlier than any clinical manifestations, which is the typical way it's diagnosed now, are carried out. So we've decided to do three revolutionary things to attack uh, Alzheimer's disease. The first is to use the data clouds in conjunction with metabolic PET scanning 
on individuals that are very high risk for disease but have not yet transitioned and follow them up until they do transition so we can get biomarkers for that earliest uh, transition. And we're putting together a population to do this now. Number two, once they do transition, the strategy that we want to use for therapy now isn't what people have thought about in the past. And I'll just remind you, there have been 600 clinical trials for Alzheimer's in the last uh, 12 years. Zero have worked. So everyone is focused in on consequences of, not causes, of Alzheimer's disease. So Dale Bredesen, actually, about 10 years ago, took a systems approach to optimizing synaptic communication, one of the things lost in Alzheimer's diseases. And he came up with a 36-point regimen that he thought could do that and did an observational trial on 100 individuals and showed that more than 80% of them, if at an early stage, could be reversed back to normal. So we're setting in step now a series of three different clinical trials that'll be testing this complex protocol in various combinatory ways. And the third effort that we're bringing into the Alzheimer's program is the realization that when you think about wellness, most people don't think it's as important to keep your mind well as to keep your body well. And one of the revolutionary ways we can really think about doing that has been pioneered by Mike Merzenich, who is a neurophysiologist uh, at uh, UCSF, who over the last 30 years has done animal and human trials that have led to really remarkable results. For example, he's shown that there are a whole series, 25 or more, of cognitive abilities that can be quantified by using simple computer games. Moreover, he's shown if you're deficient in one of these entities, you can design other games that upon playing replace that lost ability. And what he's been able to show is with regard to cognitive ability, the normal individual goes up to a max in the mid 30s and then declines the rest of his life unless he, makes, he or she makes a conscious effort uh, to exercise the mind in an appropriate way. And even more important, he did a beautiful clinical trial taking 80-year-olds and showing playing these games, making the assessments, and then playing the replacement games. He could bring 80-year-olds up to what they, in an extrapolated manner, should have been at in the 30s or so. So the idea is the brain is enormously flexible, uh, barring uh, neuronal loss. So we've integrated those kind of studies right into the clinical trials, too. And the first very preliminary one looks really, really promising. So 21st century medicine, then, is about scientific wellness and optimizing your wellness. It's about being able to optimize how you age. It's about being able to identify and reverse early disease uh, transitions and so forth. But what I'll end up by talking about are three books that I found really fascinating that are all about the future and how we can start, how we must start thinking in very different ways about how we ourselves can use these opportunities. So the first one is called The Hundred Year Life. And it's a book that is based on the observation for the last 200 years, we've gained two years every 10 years in our average lifespan. And this is going up still in a linear sort of way. So that means in 2007, for the first time, we could do a calculation that 50% of the children born would live to be 100. And the question is, what's the quality of their life? If you're 20 today, you have a 50% chance of living to be 100. If you're 40, you have a 50% chance of living to 95. If you're 60, you have a 50% chance of living to 90. So if we have all of these extra years, 
what are the implications of this? Well, they, uh, so what are you going to do with the extra uh, 20 to 30 years or so? One, you have to worry about finances. Are you going to have enough money uh, to be able to live on? How are we going to get the tangibles we need to ensure we can move into our 90s or our 100s and still be physically, actively, and mentally alert? And scientific wellness, I think, is one of the roots for that. The second thing is it's very clear that you're going to have to be able to readily accept job transitions. That is, for many people, the jobs they carry out may end, and you'll have to flip into another one. And the idea is you'll have to keep going through transitions until a much later age and so forth. A third one is, what's the quality of life? It's no fun if you're not having fun. And the intangibles, which include family and friends, the ability to learn, uh, transition jobs, all of these kind of things are really going to be vital. How are we going to educate people about these kind of possibilities? And what are the health objectives we really need to think about? And again, I would say, you've heard them, scientific wellness, the ability to eliminate chronic disease, so through early reversal and so forth, the ability to use the genetic polygenic score risks to mitigate the effects of high genetic risk in a variety of different ways, uh, and on and on. So we have the tools uh, to really bring ourselves out into this period of 90s and 100s where we can be mentally alert and physically capable. The second book, which is equally fascinating, is called The Empty Planet. And that makes the observation that in the developing world today, every single one of the nations is now reproducing at less than replacement capacity. That means their populations are starting to go down. Japan is absolutely the classic example. And what's interesting is the undeveloped countries are starting to move into this rubric too. And one of the biggest driving forces for doing this is the education and liberation of women. It is an incredible force. And the observation is, once you start in a negative slope, it is really hard to turn it around. And their prediction is China, even though it's abrogated this one-child rule for 40 years uh, recently, they're going to have a lot of difficulty turning it down. And in fact, the prediction for China with 1.4 billion people is that in about 40 years, they'll have uh, less than 700 million people. So those are the kind of numbers that you're working with. And again, they play back to how long can we be functional? And one of the really interesting points in the book is the US has to a large extent in the past been released from the effects of uh, this negative replacement rate because of immigration. And we have to think again seriously about immigration and how we can eliminate a lot of the nonsense that's going on now uh, with regard to uh, immigration. And the final point I'll make is on a book called Lifespan by David Sinclair that just came out that really transformed how I think about aging. And I'm not going to go into technical details, but I'll make three high-level observations that David has come to. So one is the idea, the absolutely astounding idea, that aging is really going to turn out to be a simple process that we can understand and we can begin to effect effectively manipulate in the not-too-distant future. Uh, number two is his supposition that when you think about it in a broad context, aging is really the root cause of a lot of chronic diseases. And you can think of a lot of reasons why that's so, but one of the most interesting ones from my point of view is we all know as we age, we start to acquire uh, the propensity for various chronic diseases and so forth. 
So if we can prevent ourselves from aging, can we keep ourselves at that 35 to 40 level and not have to worry about all these chronic diseases that get programmed in later for reasons that we don't really understand? And I'd say the final observation he made, and this is not in his book, but it was, it was made personally, is he really believes one can go uh, to easily can go out in time to 150, ca mentally capable, physically effective, and all of these kinds of things. So all I would say is place those books in the context of 21st century medicine as we've described it, and I think we begin to have solutions for at least some of the major initiatives that, uh, that we have to think about in the future. So I'd be glad to take any questions if there are any. Dr. Hood, thanks very much. Yeah. So, so we are running short on time. I, okay. I, do, I do have a, a quick question for you. Okay. Uh, you know, I think some of us were sad to see that Aravail closed earlier this year. Do you see business models forming around scientific wellness that yeah. are viable long term? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think. Airvail failed for two reasons. One, we didn't take seriously the need to educate the general populace as to the advantages of scientific wellness. And I think that was a major mistake. But two, we were absolutely handcuffed by the FDA because Airvail, although it had hundreds of disease-related actionable possibilities for individuals, couldn't give them out. So what we've done recently is reconstituted in the P4 Medicine Clinic, which is an independent clinic now, everything that Aravail was doing, plus a lot more, and it's being managed by a physician who can give out the actionable possibilities. Moreover, we've taken the uh, computational platforms and teams into ISB, and we're setting up to do a very large scale wellness program at Providence over the next five years. So we'll have a number of uh, opportunities for showing that uh, this is really going to work, but it has to work in the context of physicians. Well, I could ask you questions forever, but we do know that nutrition is one of the keys to scientific sure. wellness, sure. so <laughs> we do want to get everybody out to lunch. Okay. But and Dr. Hood, it's a real honor to have you here. And thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Hood. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Very good.